Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our panel on precision extinction. Um, we have an extraordinary group of people here today. Uh, I'll introduce them one by one. I'll tell you a little bit about what the panel is, and then we'll get cracking. So we have Marcos de Souza. He has perhaps the best job title there is, which is Secretary of Innovation for Brazil. We have Feng Zhang, who is a professor at MIT and the creator of CRISPR, one of the technologies we'll be talking about today. Many of you are surely familiar with it. We have Missy Cummings. She's the director of the Human and Auto Autonomy Lab at Duke. Mark Benioff, who's the CEO of Salesforce. And my near relative, Peter Thompson, who is the UN Special Envoy for the Oceans. So what we're going to talk about here today, the World Economic Forum put out a report and said that one of the risks in the future is precision extension, the possibility that the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution, so AI, drones, genetic engineering, could be used to not just protect the environment, but they could be used to wipe species off the planet. Um, it came out in a recent report a couple of weeks ago. So what I want to do in this panel is to talk about those risks and then also talk about the ways these new technologies can be good for species, good for diversity, good for the environment, and then also how we drive technology in the right direction. How do we make sure we make the right choices about way that, the ways that technology develops so we get the good outcomes and not the bad? Okay, so let's get cracking. I'm going to start with Mark. and I'm going to ask you, tell me one technology that you're excited about on this topic and one that you are worried about. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, well, I think one thing that I'm very, I, I guess I'll kind of bundle it together, but I think I'm gonna want Missy to help me out. Um, you know, I was uh, recently uh, hanging out uh, in Hawaii on the beach, and what I like to do is I like to go out and clean the beach a little bit. It's very meditative for me. And I was cleaning the beach, and I had it all nice and pretty and fine and wonderful and got the plastics off the beach and the water bottles, and I found a, you know, an old gas tank in the, you know, in the, in the, in the shoreline, I hauled it out. And then I was sitting there and very happy with myself, and I'm looking at everything, and I'm like, oh, I got it all perfect, this is fantastic. And then I just kind of put my hand down, and I dug up, and I noticed that all the microplastics were fully embedded in the beach, you know how that is, Peter, right? Yeah. Down, you know, as far as I could go. And I'm like, I don't have an extra lifetime to sit here <laughs> to clean all this out. This yeah. is amazing. That as the, you know, at all, all, as the ocean is basically bringing in all of this plastic, and as we have more and more plastic in the ocean, it's getting embedded into our beaches. And then I was thinking, well, what I really want is I want a beach cleaning robot. So I want <laughs> some of the great next gen vision technology, AI technology, robotic thing, and I can leave it there, and it can go through all of those grains of sand and figure out what's a grain of sand and what's actually a piece of plastic, which I think it can probably do, Missy's going to help me out, mm -hmm. and clean that beach. And I want to put those little beach cleaning robots on every beach I can find and clean our beaches, because some of our beaches are pretty disgusting, honestly, and that's, I think that's one good thing. And I think on the reverse side, is you know we're about to enter this new wave of uh, deep sea mining. And if you haven't seen some of these robots, um, these are robots bigger in some cases than this room that are gonna basically go under the ocean. It's gonna be out of sight, out of mind. They're gonna be autonomous, AI based. They're gonna be looking not for microplastic but for valuable minerals and metals and and uh, things that we've exhausted, you know, on land, and they're gonna strip mine the ocean. And um, Peter's gonna make sure that doesn't happen, but, <laughs> you know, that same technology, which is, you know, you know, of course, we're all here, or we're all waiting for our autonomous cars, we're all waiting for AI-based cars, and all that, all of that same technology is, can, can be used in these two different ways in, when it comes to the oceans. And so, that, that's been on my mind. Those are great examples. Missy, do you want to talk about um, one of your ex areas of expertise is drones? Sure. Uh, it's drones, and, and more broadly, I do a lot of work across autonomous vehicles, including driverless cars. And um, it sounds great. We all, we all would love the beach cleaning robot. But we actually have a robot that works in very similar environments. Um, it's on Nicholas Mars. actually called it the beach cleaning Roomba. Yeah, the Roomba. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it, it turns out that, you know, while technology is often seen as a panacea, I think we overestimate, in many cases, its abilities. So sand, it turns out sand is just a destroyer of systems, mechanical systems in general, but they have very, we have a lot of difficulties with the NASA Mars 
Curiosity rovers uh, because they it's just very difficult, especially when you're trying to operate remotely. Uh, but I would also tell you, while there are clear technical difficulties, for a beach cleaning Roomba robot, my biggest concern would be somebody damaging it, humans, mm -hmm. humans damaging other robots. We've seen a lot of examples across the country where robots are left to do delivery or goodwill, and we're trying to see how humans interact with them, and uh, often humans will destroy them, damage them, and so, and, and I've lived in, I lived in the Philippines where, you know, we, would put technology out and then it would be scrapped for parts, right? And so these are, in many of the cultures that we're speaking of, we have to understand the context. So it's not just species extinction, it's robot extinction. Well, you cost. know, there's this. But then I will tell you on the flip side, the, the thing about the deep sea mining with robots, uh, you know, I think that it is, we should be concerned about this and talking about it, but my concerns aren't really with the malevolent use of these technologies, the intentional malevolent use. It's the accidental malevolent use. Yeah. AI is definitely opening up Pandora's box. Yeah. Most applications of AI, we still, particularly when it comes to autonomous vehicles, we really do not understand how the underlying algorithms work. And so I'm much more concerned about accidental damage mm -hmm. that can be profound yeah. as opposed to malevolent damage. That's an excellent point and one I very much want to um, continue on. But let's, um, let's continue going. So Feng Zhang, your, um, mm -hmm. the technology you help pioneer is often talked about as one of the greatest um, hopes for species preservation and for humans and one of the greatest risks. So briefly describe what CRISPR is for everybody. Mm -hmm. Most people probably know, but let's do a brief recap and then mm -hmm. something that excites you in this front and something that scares you. Sounds good. Um, so CRISPR is a uh, gene editing technology. Uh, it's a way, it's a molecular tool that allows us to go into the DNA of cells and start to make very precise changes uh, to the DNA. So there are a lot of different applications for this technology. Imagine if we know what mutations cause cancer or which mutation cause uh, metabolic disease. We can use CRISPR to go into cells in our body and get rid of that mutation and then be able to treat the disease. In agriculture, um, we can also use it to introduce traits that are beneficial. Uh, drought resistance, cold resistance, virus resistance. All these beneficial traits we can quickly and also precisely introduce into plants to significantly uh, increase agricultural yield. So there are a lot of different applications. Um, and, and the one thing that really excites me is really the convergence of both our ability to read DNA and also to write DNA. The rapid progress that we have been making uh, in the biotech field is DNA sequencing is becoming faster and cheaper. So we can read DNA uh, at unprecedented pace. Mm -hmm. Uh, genome editing is also becoming uh, much, much more tractable. Um, and so the combination of reading DNA and writing DNA makes it possible for us to transport traits from one organism to another organism. So um, a few years ago, uh, there was a protein found uh, from an Arctic species, uh, fish, uh, that provides anti-freezing um, purposes. And so it was trans uh, that this protein was transferred into strawberry uh, to create strawberries that doesn't freeze. Uh, inadvertently, that protein also turned the strawberry into blue rather than red. It's um, <laughs> kind of a strange strawberry. But, but I think the, the really exciting thing is that as we sequence more and more organisms, we can now find interesting properties that these organisms evolved uh, to allow them to most optimally survive in their own environment and transfer some of those into other organisms so that we can improve uh, the property. Um, when we're facing with extinction of different species, imagine we can transfer the ability to survive uh, into a different organism so that we can prevent the extinction of that organism. So if the tuna are going extinct, we can insert a gene that will help them survive whatever right. disease in the ocean is hurting them. The only risk is that it might turn them blue. <laughs> That's right. Um, Marcos, let's talk about Brazil. You know, you've heard um, these three talk about some of the technologies they're looking for, some of the risks they see. Tell me how you think it, it might play out in Brazil for good and for ill. You have, obviously, rainforests, which the whole world cares deeply about. You also have long coastlines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, uh, in Brazil, what we are discussing, at least from the government perspective, is regulation. Mm -hmm. uh, the characteristic of this fourth industrial revolution is the speed of the technology advancement. Yeah. And as you know, the 
government regulation is always behind this technology advancement speed. So uh, it's a challenge for us because the other previous revolution, they took longer. Mm -hmm. So we could prepare and adapt our regulations properly. But this one is going too fast. And, and we, uh, for us as a government, not only in Brazil, but we are discussing here in the forum, uh, for different governments, it's a new challenge because mm -hmm. of the speed. Um, just to give you some examples in Brazil, uh, we are talking about biotechnology. Uh, we have a national commission for biosafety that approves all the, the genetic modified organisms. Um, there's, of course, a lot of pressure from different parts of the society, mm -hmm. uh, but its, it's, uh, its members are from the scientific community. So this is a problem because uh, sometimes the time to analyze the potential impact for environment in this application of new technologies is too long. Mm -hmm. So it delays the adoption of new technologies in Brazil, and I believe in other places also, because they, they go deeper to know the impacts. Because mm -hmm. if there is something wrong, mm -hmm. and the government approves that technology that goes wrong, there's a possibility it will be on the government. So mm -hmm. the regulation about biotechnology in Brazil yeah. is critical, because you know we are a yeah. agriculture power, and it impacts directly our competitiveness. So this is an example. Another example about also regulation uh, is our drones. Mm -hmm. How do you regulate the airspace for drones? And in Brazil, we are we are seeing a lot of opportunities for drones in the agriculture yep. to track all the crops, to know precisely where you use the agri the agrotoxins and fertilizers and so on. Uh, but there's no regulation yet mm -hmm. in Brazil. Um, some people are still discussing uh, how to pilot drones, how to train people to pilot drones, mm -hmm. but we are seeing that it's nonsense because all the drones will be autonomous. So it increases the complexity f from the point of view of the regulation. How do you regulate autonomous drones? Because it's not one. When you go to Brazil, the, the crops are big, are hundreds of kilometers mm -hmm. that they have to cover. So probably they will use cloud of drones autonomously to do that uh, and to track everything. But there's no regulation yet. Let's talk about the rainforest second and the arms race. So presumably people who are illegal loggers who are chopping down the arms race can use satellite imagery to figure out where the best trees are. They can use drones to figure out the areas that haven't been logged. And presumably on the other side, you can track where those people are operating, right? You can track the drones. You can see where trees have been logged illegally. You can tag the trees so that you can see whether the crop is actually from where they say it's from. Who's winning that arms race right now, the loggers or the government? <laughs> I believe it's the loggers uh -huh. because we are seeing a lot of development of this kind of technologies in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a lot of Brazilian startups partnering with Monsanto, Syngenta, and other yeah. uh, companies making together the seed development, but integrated with drones, with sensors, with mm -hmm. IoT technology in order to track that. So they are not waiting for regulation, of course. Yeah. They are going uh, in minute. front of that. But at some point, when it increases a lot and it scales up, probably we'll have to do some smart regulation. And so Peter, I want to ask you a similar question, because with the oceans, there's got to be a similar arms race, right? There have got to be people who are you know, the fishermen hunting the most valuable fish are using satellite imagery. They're using technology to bring the fish out past the 200-mile border so they can be hunted without jurisdiction. But of course, we're also using technology to track tuna and to make sure that places that buy tuna are buying tuna that was caught legally. So tell me how, as somebody who's got more experience regulating the oceans than anybody else, tell me how you can help set the regulations so that the side of preservation wins the arms race, not the side, the side of extraction? Uh, I think uh, there's a lot of good news uh, to give in that regard. And, and I would uh, look at the glass half full rather than half empty, in spite of the fact that the ocean is being put under uh, most awful pressures by humanity, whether it's- Half full, but a little acidic, maybe? Well, it's uh, just that everything that has been said by the, the panelists so far, to me, are, ha are half full uh, mm -hmm. responses. Because, you know, for example, uh, robotics. Uh, robots might not look like sand, but they like water. And there, there are uh, 10 rivers in the world which produce a 
according to some stats, 90% of the plastic pollution in the ocean. I mean, surely there must be robots that can go to those 10 rivers and clean up and deal with 90% of our plastic pollution right away there. On CRISPR, uh, as you were talking, I was thinking uh, last week I was in Fiji launching the International Year of the Reef with Eric Solheim uh, on a, the third biggest reef in the Southern Hemisphere, the Great Sea Reef of Fiji. And uh, looking at that coral and just the, the tragic thought that, you know, if you believe people like Sir David Attenborough, there will be no coral reefs by the end of this century. Uh, but what we're finding from people like Wood's whole uh, research is that there are resilient types of coral. So if there are resilient types of coral, surely CRISPR could develop those resilient types or change all coral to be resilient and we could save coral reefs. Uh, so, you know, I see that in a positive way. I, I, if there's a downside to that, somebody tell me, but I, I would see that as a very positive thing. Uh, as far as governance is concerned, you know, the United Nations is, is sluggish, as you all know, but... Uh, in December, uh, you know, a month ago, uh, there was two really big movements. Uh, one was the approval for what's called BB&J, and that's Marine Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdictions. That is basically to get law in place to end this piracy zone that covers the majority of this planet, which is the high seas. Uh, the, the conference will start in September. It will last for a couple of years. Law will result. When you start a UN conference, you end up with law. The question is, how good is the law? But there will be law resulting, and that will be fitted into UNCLOS. So good move there. The, 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 the piracy era for the high seas is going to come to an end. Mm. Uh, secondly, the, um, you know, we know more about the face of the moon and, uh, the, uh, and of Mars than we do about the bottom of the sea. Uh, and the UN approved the international decade for ocean science for sustainable development. That was approved in December. Uh, it'll be run out of the IOC, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission in Paris. And it's a decade where, for the first time, humanity is really going to focus on ocean science. Uh, and that runs from 2021 to 2030. So there are good things happening in, at the international level. Just finally, though, the, since seabed mining was mentioned, and yeah, it is a horror story to a lot of people, I was president of the International Seabed Authority for two years. I can tell you that seabed mining is definitely coming, but I can also tell you that it's not allowed at present. Why? We don't have regulations at the International Seabed Authority to grant licenses. But again, that's law which is under uh, preparation now and will be ready soon. But it's law which has to be approved by all the signatories of UNCLOS. So, you know, it's not like, this is not cowboy territory. This is probably the best governed part of the planet is the seabed because it's governed by, the, by UNCLOS and the International Seabed Authority. But what I've been ramming home to those guys is we must lift the bar very high on the precautionary principle when it comes to that regulation if somebody wants to go seabed mining. They've got to be able to prove to us they're not, they're not going to uh, kill the goose that lays the golden egg. Mark, do you agree? Are you confident that regulations will be able to prevent seabed mining? And are you optimistic that the government can prevent some of the worst technological things that happen in the ocean? Well, I, first of all, Peter's doing an amazing job, and uh, we're so lucky to have him as our UN Ocean Absolutely. Commissioner, and that, you know, that the world is starting to work on the oceans is so important. I think that that's, it's been ignored for far too long, mm. and it's great that we are moving forward, and <laughs> like what he's mentioning about governance of the high seas, I mean, it's... You know, this, it's the Wild West and still, and, it, and that he's leading the charge to rein it in. This is great news for the oceans. And when you look at the major ocean issues, things like acidification, which is the seas are getting warmer, you know, global warming is creating a warmer ocean. It's not, it's going to change the biodiversity of the ocean. It's happening. We were talking also that there was a panel here at the conference on um, led by uh, some very pioneering Chinese scientists on uh, bacteria in the ocean and kind of a revelation that the ocean, if you will, kind of has a biome, yeah. like the human being has a biome, and that this uh, bacteria that they were talking about that they're sampling is at this 25,000-foot level and that how it can hold or control methane uh, release. That was an amazing session uh, here with David Agus. Um, when we look at acidification, when we look at overfishing, you mentioned overfishing, certainly low-hanging yep. satellites, which are emerging, and we're about to have thousands and thousands and thousands of real-time satellite imaging. That's going to dramatically reduce overfishing because we're going to know 
where every fishing vessel is in real time across the world. We're not going to wait for you know, this idea of beacons or whatever in the, in the ships. We're going to have that inf mm -hmm. information right off the satellites. And um, plastics. I mean, soon we're going to have more plastic in the ocean than fish. But th this has got to be dealt with. <laughs> yeah. And uh, what I hope Missy's going to come up with some robots for us. Uh, but we also saw Boyan Slat is here at the yeah. conference who runs Ocean Cleanup. He has his big, big experiment mm -hmm. where he's going to try to create a passive system for cleaning the ocean. But this, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is a big deal. Like Peter said, that 90% of this ocean garbage is coming from these 10 rivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, everyone, if you've been to the beach anywhere in the world, you, you can see it. Now, I was just in Brazil also and just kind of coming back to all of our role in one thing I, I think that's very important about the fourth industrial revolution, and then we talk about this a lot in our center in San Francisco, is cultures mm -hmm. and how cultures and consciousness also are going to have to change in regards to a lot of this technology, the awareness. Uh, it's one of the really important things about a multi-stakeholder dialogue like we're having on stage here or that's happening at the WEF. But, you know, when I was just in Brazil and, you know, I was an incredible country, maybe the most beautiful country I've ever been to, and I was out on the beach uh, at night and enjoying uh, the sun coming down. And I noticed that some people are bringing their garbage to the beach because they're waiting for the ocean to come and take the garbage out. And I'm sure that's not true of everybody in Brazil. But I was just noticing, like, wow, that's not happening you know, where I live. It's a different culture, different consciousness. We need to somehow get everybody on board um, uh, if we're going to save, for example, save our oceans. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to, you had about 19 extremely interesting things there. I want to focus on one in the middle, which is you said the ocean has a microbiome, right? And that we can engineer the microbiome perhaps to change methane absorption or for other reasons. That sounds great. That all sounds terrifying. So um, someone else want to talk about the risks and rewards about messing with the microbiome of the ocean? Um, <clears throat> sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I, I do think we need to be careful about engineering uh, microorganisms and, and releasing them out in, into the environment. Biology is really complicated. Um, usually within a cell, there are thousands, if not tens of thousands of different genes that play very complicated interactions with each other. When you change one gene, um, predicting that it will uh, help uh, reduce methane or try to uh, improve some property that will be beneficial for us, it's hard to predict how that one protein would interact with all the other things in the cell and change something else about it. I'll give you one example from, from the human therapeutic side, just to give you a sense of the complexity. So about single digit percent of the human population carry a genetic mutation in a gene called CCR5. And those individuals are immune to HIV infection. So you may think that this is a pretty good mutation. Uh, why don't we just vaccinate everybody by removing CCR5 from, from everybody. Turns out, those individuals who are immune to HIV, they have an increased risk for, for West Nile virus. And so even though we don't have a West Nile epidemic right now, yeah. if we prophylactically install, install that mutation into everybody, then if the virus came, then we'll be really in serious trouble. So when we're engineering organisms in the microbiome, in the ocean, uh, especially something that really affects the global environment, I think we'll have to be very careful and, and, and proceed with a lot of caution. Are there other? Yeah, and I think to add to that, we were talking before, but you know, recently we were having some Zika issues in the United States, mm -hmm. and there was definitely a very high level discussion in the government, should we use you know, CRISPR and gene drives Right. to wipe out the mosquitoes so that we, you know, got rid of the carriers. And, you know, the world is a complex system. Human beings are complex systems. Mm -hmm. And one little change, you don't, it, you're going to have unintended consequences. And I think that's a very important right. Okay, but let's go down this a little bit. So you have to, we have to be cautious. Mm -hmm. Totally agreed. But can we be more precise about that? So let's say that there's a technology that we have a pretty good chance will reduce, reduce global warming by sucking down carbon dioxide or reducing methane releases. And we have, like, a real crisis with global warming. So... At what stage do we say, you know what, let's just do it. Let's try it. Let's re-engineer the ocean. I think one of the things that, especially for biological systems, uh, it would be important to engineer containment mechanisms. Mm -hmm. So rather than doing something that's irreversible, um, can we engineer a circuit uh, in these biological organisms so that once we release it into the environment, and just in case, 
something goes wrong, we can switch it off. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can recall uh, this, this strategy back. Miss, you think that's a good idea? Yeah, I was just um, thinking to myself, we already do that in engineering. That's why when you fly a commercial jet, it's so safe. It's because they're triple redundant, right? So we have two backup systems in technology. Again, though, I would actually say the issues that you see with CRISPR in terms of it sounds good, but there are often these um, unforeseen problems that emerge. It's the same with AI. We see, you know, yes, there are some applications that can be good, but it turns out for driverless cars, for example, right now, one of the things that was just recently discovered in the last six months is that using um, very easy passive hacking techniques, i.e. just putting a few stickers on a stop sign can trick computer vision from seeing a stop sign and makes it see a speed limit of 45 miles an hour sign, right? And, and so we had no idea that these things were possible until just the last six months. And yeah. so as a researcher, what I worry about is, well, if we're still finding out these emergent properties of these technologies, CRISPR, AI, yet there are many companies um, and agencies that want to take these technologies and start deploying them in the real world, but it's still so nascent that we're not really sure what we're doing. So I do think that it, it needs to be more of a collaborative arrangement between academia and governments and companies to understand what's really mature and what is still very experimental. Well, Peter and Marcos, you want to weigh in on that? What is the role of, um, of government in regulating these technologies and setting policies? Because often government trails behind the technologies and understanding. Yeah. I was just thinking as the, as the panelists were talking that you know, geoengineering came up there. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the ethics of geoengineering, this is not something that's discussed. Uh, in fact, geoengineering is not discussed much, but as Let's somebody it. rightly pointed out, it, 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 you know, it needs to be developed as a sort of backup plan, yeah. but I think it's the ethics of it. When I was president of the General Assembly, I tried to stimulate a, 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 a day of discussion about ethics of innovation. A lot of people came over from Silicon Valley, uh -huh. and I tried to put government and, uh, and, the, um, and Silicon Valley together for a day to just start that ethical conversation, yeah. because it is missing at the moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have it in the United States for something like CRISPR, I think it has to go to like a Senate uh, ethics committee where they discuss it and so on. Uh, but for globally, I think this is definitely lacking at the moment and, sh and, and is needed a global discussion on the ethics of artificial intelligence, uh, genetic uh, manipulation and so on. Mm -hmm. Marcus? And I I'm sure the scientists would appreciate it as much as, as the governments would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, actually, I will answer with a question to Mark Benioff. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges for us in the government when professor is, is, is developing a technology are the impacts. Mm -hmm. How do we simulate different scenarios more accurately, more precisely? What are the impacts that will generate? This is a long process, involves a lot of scientific data mm -hmm. and so on. How could we use IT? IT technology and computing power and artificial intelligence and whatever to create and to be more precise on the impact that could generate. Because this discussion takes longer. How could we use technology mm -hmm. to use scientific data, evidence-based decisions faster and more precisely? Because it's important to try to separate what is ideology, because there's a lot on this field, from yep. based ev evidence-based uh, decisions. Mm -hmm. That's what my question. That's How a good question. Is that mm -hmm. to accelerate? This? You know, I think that you know we have the opportunity today, and um, and I'm going to also link back to Missy. But you know, there's more data than ever, and there's more data coming from all these sensors, from uh, um, um, not not just all aspects of the environment, but you know, we just we're talking about. DNA sequencing, that massive amount of new types of data available, yep. and that through that we have the ability to have analytics and insights that, that we've really never had before. It, it remain, we, we are in a data revolution. I think coupling it with artificial intelligence, that, that's where it can get exciting because human beings are not going to be able to sort through all of this data. Mm -hmm. It's just, and all of a sudden we, we're looking for AI maybe to help us or to guide us or to augment human intelligence, to have that insight based on all this incredible new data that we have. And I think that's very much your answer. And, and I think when you 
look at all the data you mentioned, all the drones you have, and the sensors in the environment, and all that. When you bring all that in, um, I think you're going to be able to have some tremendous insight. I'll give you a very kind of basic business example. At Salesforce, my company, we're using AI in a way that we've never used it before, and we haven't released it yet to our customers because we're still not sure about it, kind of to Missy's point. Yeah. And, 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 and how we're using it is we have large databases on how we run our company. And how I run my company in the, as a manual process is every Monday I have a staff meeting, like I'm sure a lot of CEOs do, and I have my top 30 or 40 executives around a table from, it's a virtual table, there's people from all over the world as well as physically with me, and we figure out how we're doing as a company, and we're looking at all of this analysis. But now I have a new person at the table, and it's kind of an empty chair, and um, we have a technology called Einstein. And I, as a CEO, ask Einstein, okay, I heard what everybody said, but Einstein, what do you actually think? And now that I've been using this technology for well over a year, and each and every time I ask it, it always has an insight about an executive or a territory or a product that I would never have seen. There's too much data for me to understand what's going on. Mm -hmm. And also, I have executives, like I'm sure a lot of people do, who are holding back information or gating, what I call gating information from me. They, things they don't want me to know, because maybe things aren't going that well. Einstein has no bias. So Einstein says, well, like I had a re situation recently with a European executive, and I said, well, I don't think this European executive is going to make their number. I'm so sorry. And then the European executive <laughs> just got so upset. And they're like, no, I am, and here's why. And then I said, no, I'm sorry. You got this problem, this problem. This person doesn't have this in place. You didn't do this over here. And it's looking at years in, of data. That's, I, mean, you, I think it's a good example, actually. Because certainly, like, when, you know, here we have physicians and medical professionals who, you know, you walk into your doctor's office today, your doctor does not have that full understanding of all of your data, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's, there's going to, AI is going to be, first and foremost, I think, in the example I just gave, a partner. Mm -hmm. You know, in the medical, exam, exa medical example, um, and this is, goes directly to your question, today when we ship a CT scanner, it's a dumb device. It's not really intelligent. You, 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 you jump in it, it does a scan, maybe you do a scan of your heart or your body or your brain or whatever you're looking at, and then somebody called a radiologist comes and looks and says, oh, what about this, what about that, what about this? You know, but in the next generation of the CT scanners, it's not gonna be a dumb device. It's gonna be a smart device and it's gonna be a diagnostic device. That's the leap, and that's actually what you're looking for. Mm -hmm. That is, what the CT scanner is doing is it's generating all of this data, like what's happening in your country with all of your innovation. And then you want that AI, basically, in the scanner to say, oh, yeah, that has a hepatic liver, and we better go look at that. You know, instead of waiting for somebody who knows what that looks like to come in and say, oh, yeah, this is my diagnosis. And I think that, that is our next leap in the short term in technology. Things that are, that are previously devices, technology, robots, cars even, you know, we don't have to make the full leap to autonomous vehicles to have smart cars. Mm -hmm. So let's not, you know, we can, we, and we're gonna be, we can be augmented through artificial intelligence as human experts, as doctors, as CEOs, as government officials, and also global governance, you know, I, I mean, I think that we have to really come back to you mm -hmm. because global governance, I think it's heightened in this environment. It's yeah. far more important than it was a decade ago. Yeah. And so there's more of a burden on you. Would you agree with that? Well, I do because you know, when it comes to the ocean, there's only one ocean and uh, it's uh, no good fixing everything in Brazil and leaving everything else unfixed because um, as we know, things like plastic migrate across the ocean. Uh, fish don't recognize national boundaries, etc. <laughs> So, um, no, I mean, the more I hear the panel talk, the, the, the more I'm confirmed in you know, what I said originally, that, that I, I'm a glass half full on this. Yeah. I, I think innovation uh, and innovative technology is going to be a huge part of the global solution to the reversing the cycle of decline that the ocean's currently caught in. 
whether it is on the fisheries sector. I mean, you know, there are obvious applications of innovative technology there. Cleaning up pollution, plastic pollution we discussed. That uh, the, the decline of coral reefs, you know, CRISPR could have a role there. Uh, and so on. So um, rather than seeing rogue technology as something that's going to get out of hand and, and destroy the life in the ocean, I, we're doing a very good job of that without rogue technology. <laughs> Uh, what I think we can do is use technology to help us in reversing that cycle of decline. I'm very Excellent. confident about that. Mm -hmm. Missy, do you agree? Are you more optimistic at the now or yes. at the beginning of the panel? I, I am. I mean, I'm a futurist and a technologist, so mm -hmm. uh, clearly um, I'm going to be positive about the future. I think it's worth looking back, though. Um, Ten years ago, this community, even here at the World Economic Forum, uh, but more globally, uh, we're very anti-drone. So I've been actually doing yeah. drone research since 2001. Whoa. That's a long time. So you, most of you didn't even know drones were a thing in academia in 2001. And so, you know, and I saw a huge backlash against drones. Really up until about 2013 was the big pivot point, mm -hmm. and it's rare that you can look at a point in time and say technology has you know, culturally changed, and that's when Jeff Bezos made his announcement that Amazon would start delivery with yeah. drones. And it was that moment that caught the public's attention to understand, wait, 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 this technology that's gonna kill us all is now going to be used in a different way. And, and it's interesting, over the years, I do a lot of interviews, and they were all very pointed in a very negative way about drones. Mm -hmm. And now that conversation is very rare for me. I only rarely have to defend the use of drones in military settings. Most of the time we're talking about commercial applications. And in terms of conservation, I think one of the interesting statistics is for non-military applications of drones, one-third of all drones are being used in some sort of conservation effort. Mm -hmm. So I work with companies who uh, do drones for tracking elephants, for example. Uh, and this is a good example we were discussing earlier yeah. that you know, drones can be very good at tracking wildlife. The higher they are, the better you have. Um, one of the flip uh, sides to this is Turns out elephants do not like drones. They run, we've had elephants throw mud at drones. Uh, and it turns out, this goes to that unintended consequence, it turns out the research we've been doing at Duke is drones are on the same frequency as bees. Mm -hmm. And elephants hate bees. That's really their only enemy in the wild. And so, you know, but should we continue to use drones to track elephants? Yes, we should. It's still a very valid technology, but now we need to understand we need to do it higher. We need different kinds of engines. Maybe we need to change something we call our concepts of operations to make sure that we're not doing more damage by using them. But that doesn't mean we should eradicate them. Or can you get Jeff Bezos to talk to the elephants and maybe they'll flip too? Uh, yeah, but you know, it's interesting, this, this idea of the technology, uh, I call it the drone space race. Uh, the poachers now have drones, which they're ordering off of Amazon. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, so do all the conservationists. Um, and so I think you will never win this battle. There's never a which is better, which is worse. The technology is just a tool. Yeah. So in the end, what we need to do with the technology is and we were just discussing this, it needs to augment humans. We need to learn how to bring it in as a tool and not a panacea. Um, I'm gonna and, and to add to that, I, I think that we touched on this briefly, but, and I'd love to get your thought on that, which is that, you know, these next generation of low-flying satellites. So we're, you know, there's companies now that are launching tens of thousands of low-flying satellites, and you're gonna have that kind of imaging that you're talking about or that you're looking for um, available to you, real-time imaging of so many things that today are maybe limited by that drone will be, you'll have covered in, on, on a big swath of geography, um, not just for fishing, you know, uh, and uh, survey, fishing surveillance is a great example, is we, we have to surveil the ocean to see if somebody is fishing in a marine protected area, for example. In your case, you want to make sure that there aren't um, people heading to those elephants. I think with low-flying satellites coupled with artificial intelligence, soon 
you'll have that early warning system that you just do not have today because you'll know before they get there that something is about to happen. That there's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, so, some some a much greater awareness created by that that real time imaging. I think you, that's you correct. Think that's yeah, right? I, I think it's correct, and I think what people forget are that drones. There's nothing special about a drone. It's a flying camera, yeah. and the reason that they've become so popular is that access to satellite imaging right now is prohibitively expensive for most companies. And so I, I don't think it means that we'll get away from drones. Um, for their ability to do local response in real time, it will be um, unmatched. But certainly for these long-term monitoring situations, as satellite technology improves, that will, and the cost comes down, that will become more available. But in, one of the things I, in the ocean discussion, the ocean debris, just behind ocean debris is space debris junk problem. Mm -hmm. And so actually we're trying to come up with space robots now mm. to try to clean up the debris field in space, mm -hmm. which is substantial. So mm. not nearly as imminent, mm. but also if we're going to go to these massively numbers of low-flying satellites in orbit, um, we actually just don't have the room right now. So we need, uh, we need sand cleaning robots, we need ocean cleaning robots, we need space cleaning robots. Uh, we have about 15 minutes left. I'd like to start, uh, I'd like to open it up to the audience. We have five marvelous panelists here. Um, raise your hand and ask some questions. Yes, right there in red. Yeah, I think it. I Actually, so, so the live stream can hear. The question was more details about um, Einstein. And I should note for all of the questioners, if you could take the microphone, because that will make it better for our web audience as well. Okay, Mark. Yeah, I'll try to make it more generic to artificial intelligence in general. But of course, you have very. We have very large data sets in our company, and um, that very large data sets for an average person, CEO. I'm just you know, how do I make the best decisions? And the way I'm going to make the best decisions is by being able to take all that data and, and, and do that. I think in every single example we went through here, there's more and more data. That's the big challenge. It's one of the big challenges of the fourth industrial revolution is more data than ever. When you couple the more data then with AI, then that becomes an opportunity to augment human capability. Mm -hmm. So that as a CEO, I can ask a question of Einstein, my virtual management team ma member, and say, well, wh how is the company doing? Are we, are we going to make our quarter? How is this product? Wh what geography should I travel to to have the biggest impact for the company? For a doctor, it's exactly the same situation. For the person who runs the, the, the oceans, it's exactly the same situation. For him, one of the greatest challenges is he's done an incredible job and all of his associates over the last decade in creating these marine protected areas. It, it's one of the great accomplishments, I think. Yeah. But are we surveilling them correctly and really making sure? Well, we got there's a lot of data out there. We need more data. Then we'll couple it with AI. Then the AI will call him, his Einstein, whatever it'll be called. We'll call him and say, hey, there's a boat heading into this area and you gotta yeah. you know, send your patrol out to, to fix it. And I think, that's the next step for a lot of these industries and a lot Especially of these challenges. Especially a lot of the MPAs are very remote, like sort of Pitcairn and Henderson. Yeah, it, it's a, you know, his point is, is that some of the areas of the ocean that we're trying to protect are the most remote areas with the most pristine areas and the, you know, specialized uh, species and, and, and highest levels of biodiversity that, you know, the UN is just saying, well, let's make sure we actually keep this perfect. Well, if all of a sudden there's some big trawler heading into that area, we need to make sure he gets a text, you know, yeah. at three in the morning, and that they send there, yeah. you know, notify that gov local yeah. government, whoever it is, to send that patrol out and stop that boat. Today we can't, we can't really do that in real time with that kind of efficacy, the same efficacy that I'm mentioning when I'm running my company or the same efficacy that a doctor can in terms of diagnostic or capa but we that is the short term leap for technology yeah. that is within the next few years right would you agree oh yeah this, this is absolutely yeah this is where we are today we are right there and i think for a lot of you know like i said we have it now internally 
I think one of the reasons that I am, you know, had good performance as a CEO is I have this kind of technology and I want to make that available to all my customers, but I am cautious because it has not been all perfect. <laughs> there have been issues. We're in, a, we're in a world, and that's another example, mm -hmm. where it's like, okay, I don't want to turn this over and then get a call from a CEO uh, that he or she made a bad decision about the, because we didn't have this exactly right yet. <laughs> well, I happen to know from the green room that Peter was up at three in the morning, so he'll get the text from <laughs> Einstein. Uh, we had a question here in the front row. Thank you, Esben Bertheide from Norway. Uh, it's a fascinating discussion. I think uh, the clear message we're getting is that this technology is coming, or these technologies are coming. They're not going to go away. We have to relate to them, and there's a need for some kind of normative conversation on how to deal with it. So my challenge to anyone in the panel is what exactly is the place and the content uh, of a... This, what do We want to regulate, or we want to put a normal normative framework on it, but what should it say? I mean, it's clearly it's not going to say uh, stop technology from developing, stop good uses. And, and is, it the, is it purely in Peter Thompson's in the public domain? Is it the UN? Or is it in, a, in some kind of more uh, interactive framework between the technology driving industries and, and the public regulator? Excellent question. Key question for Davos. Who wants, to, who wants this one? Well, I want to just take it from a, as a trustee of Davos, I would like to just say one thing about that, which is that this is the purpose of this conversation why we're here. But this idea that Klaus Schwab, you know, coming out of UC Berkeley in the late 60s, we don't know everything he was doing at that point, but one thing he did do <laughs> is wrote an incredible paper on stakeholder theory. This idea that through a multi-stakeholder dialogue like we're having up here, we can elevate consciousness and solve and or work towards you know, some progress. And I think it really uh, evolves. The conversation we're having here, we've now built a center in San Francisco in the Presidio, uh, which is with the World Economic Forum, to have these dialogues, and we're having these dialogues with the very technologists that are, that are creating it, and we'd like to invite everybody in this room uh, to join us you know, at that center for the, continuing these discussions or bring your management teams or your colleagues to that center for, the, for that discussion. But I think this is the very, you know, this is why, and one of the reasons I love Davos, I've been coming here since 2002, is because I think this is probably one of the only places we can have this dialogue like exactly like this. You're here. Exactly Anybody else like want to take a crack at this? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Mark just said there, but specifically to your question, I think the regulations of this subject area we've been talking about lie principally with, within national boundaries. Um, by the way, seabed mine, mining, of course, the countries have their own EEZs and can do what they like with them. Uh, but um, it's principally the regulations within countries. But where the global discussion, where the Davos discussion, the UN discussion is really necessary is the ethical side of things. Because, of course, if one country gets a certain technology um, or, or is aware of a certain technology, let's take CRISPR, for example, um, and uh, my, my country might say, no, no, that's playing God. We don't want that in our country. Well, there'll be people in, in our country who will also point out, but don't you realize that that's just putting us, us at a competitive disadvantage because if it's happening in that country, that country, and that country, it's happening for the world. Uh, so uh, that's the limitation of just mm -hmm. taking a national view on things. So that's why the, the global uh, discussion, particularly on the ethics side, is really important, I think. Yeah. Yeah, uh, and the trick question is how to balance innovation and development and uh, regulation. And that's the third, time, the third event that I participated in the last two days that's discussing exactly the same question. And the, but there are some solutions that were uh, discussing this issue. Uh, one is the role of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Center in San Francisco that develops projects to accelerate regulations about these new issues. So uh, Rwanda, for instance, is developing a drone airspace regulation based on this experience for the fourth industrial revolution. Another option that was, just, that was discussed was about having a regulatory sandbox where the government could try for a short period of time uh, and try this regulation and change it faster. Uh, so this is uh, one of the options because it was a complete agreement be, uh, among governments representatives here in Davos that sometimes we spend four or five years to regulate something. Mm -hmm. And when we regulate and put in place, everything has changed. So we have to begin everything from the, the scratch. Yeah. 
All right, we have a question in the second row, please. Thank you. My name is Wouter from uh, Holland. Um, a lot of the amazing technologies that, that have been discussed uh, could qualify as geoengineering almost. Um, and especially with regard to combating climate change, I think geoengineering is becoming a larger part of that debate. And I'm very curious uh, about the panelists' view on uh, concrete technologies that could help uh, combat climate change and maybe through geoengineering. Mm. I, I'll just say that that's a great question because in my, the little, you know, we all live in little filter bubbles, perhaps the most divisive issue is geoengineering, right? Because so many people feel like we've got to do it. We have to do it now. It's the best hope. We have to, you know, shoot sulfates into the atmosphere. We have to pull down carbon dioxide. And then other half of the people I work with and know are like, well, I don't know, you start even talking about that, then we'll stop reducing, reusing, and recycling. It's an awesome issue to discuss. So, experts, what should we do? So, so I think on the biological side, um, I think it's quite promising because um, when we talk about engineering biological organisms and then releasing that into the environment, um, because we're, we're starting to learn how to program biology, we can begin to build these control, controllable circuits with redundancy so that when you do release this geoengineering solution that's biologically inspired and, and based, um, it's possible to have the ability to reverse it. That's right, yeah. I wanted to ask you this earlier, but you know, we've been talking about AI, and we've been talking about AI at levels that the humans don't understand, right? So this is the wonderful thing about where AI is going, where Einstein will make predictions, and you don't even know how Einstein made the predictions. So as we reach that level of sophistication, does it make it harder to build in a kill switch? Like, if we're not sure how the system's operating, how do we know we can turn the system off? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I, think, I think AI will help us understand more, because as we, as we collect more data, uh, both um, just the sequences of biological material, but also the interaction of how biological programs work. Um, AI will help us understand and be able to predict if you perturb one element of this complex program, how is that going to affect the overall execution in that organism? Um, so I see that as a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, uh, and to add to that, you don't have to go any farther than look at the elections mm -hmm. and what happened with social media and what's happened in the last 90 days, and social media CEOs uh, talking about the unintended consequences of social media technology. We don't have to make the jump all the way to CRISPR and AI and robotics. <laughs> you can just look at the current news stories and front page stories of CEOs who make this statement. I didn't realize that our technology could be used like that. We just didn't understand the technology that we built. We didn't understand that that could happen. Right. Am I right? Isn't that the story? That is the story of the last two months in technology, the story of the yeah. last two years in technology. Yeah. The reckoning that, is the big that, story. That's an example, right? So that's, we're not going to the most sophisticated, we don't have to go all the way to, we don't have to go all the way to gene drives. Right, we don't even understand Twitter. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's, an, it's a great point. Spot on. So I think that that's an illumination. I think the other illumination has to, we have to come back to here where, you know, when we look at artificial intelligence, the ability to have this dramatic impact, and we talk about it making us healthier, wealthier, smarter, um, I think you have to start to ask, is this about haves and have nots when it comes to AI, yeah, yeah. especially in regards to global governance? You know, when I walk into the UN, we talk about all the human rights, right? Isn't there so like a big wall that talks about these are the rights of human, is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, and so I wanted to ask you, based on what you're hearing, is AI a basic human right? Should it be on that wall? Should all human beings have access <laughs> to this technology since this is gonna be so important going forward? You know, I think, Mark, you're touching on something that is uh, absolutely at the core of everything I hear coming out of uh, Silicon Valley. Uh, made a trip over there, as I mentioned. Uh, uh, and I came away from there seeing a new vision of the world. Yeah, you know, we're all drive, I drove around in the driverless cars and you know, I saw the AI and what it could do and all the rest. A week later, I was doing a tour of Africa. You know, I was in Central African Republic and uh, Addis and things. And I was in, in the congestion of camel carts and trucks, huge trucks and uh, all those different forms going through, you know, pothole roads and everything. I would be so embarrassed to stand up in the town square and, and, and tell them what I'd just heard in Silicon Valley because it just 
patently was just for a rich set of people in the world, a small percentage, and the majority of human beings will never get anywhere near that stuff anytime soon. So, you know, it's not something you could even discuss over there. So I think we have to be aware that uh, you know, we, we, we cannot be shaping a future where we're, you know, that would be the dystopia for me. Yeah, that, so that, that half of us or a quarter of us yeah. live in this amazing world where we live forever and the rest of us are, are peasants sitting in our countries like yeah. Fiji and Africa. So does equality then become a major discussion point when it re in regards to all of these technologies? Is it, is you know, that that's why I keep coming back to this, this point about ethics. I think that is where in the, it should be in the global commons, that we have that ethical discussion of where, where is AI taking us all uh, and employment, all, right. the, all those arguments are, are, are common problems for us, not just for uh, rich countries. All right, so we have time for one last question, so here in the second row. I have a question for, uh, sorry, Douglas McCauley, University of California, Santa Barbara. I have a question for the academics and the representatives from governance. So companies like Marx are on the cutting edge of developing new technologies to streamline efficiency and problem solve in business. Are these technologies that are being developed in industry getting to researchers, conservationists, getting to governance, getting to managers of these systems fast enough? And are, are they there for application yeah. and use? I'd like to just answer a slight derivative of that because I think it will help you understand the broader context. Um, we are in a global AI crisis right now for talent. We cannot, universities cannot put out enough people who understand AI. AI is many things. It's actually a very broad umbrella. AI is very good for, for a lot of what we heard here is post hoc analytical reasoning. Um, but that's very different from AI that controls safety critical systems like cars and planes, and uh, we don't have enough across the spectrum. So you say, are, we, uh, is, are these good lessons learned getting to the companies? The answer is probably not, because companies are running so fast on the AI hamster wheel that they can't keep up. We can't keep up enough in producing the people, and this compressed timeline for education means that we, me, other professors here, we're producing people that probably are not getting the comprehensive education in AI that they need because we are working to get them out so fast. Education programs are very archaic. We want to stick with the, the way that we went through school. We still train people in the university setting globally like we did 30 years ago, and that's just simply not a good model anymore. So there's a lot to be done, I think, in the education sphere. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I think it's really not just AI, it's really more broadly for highly skilled, trained uh, people coming out of academia, uh, we are not producing enough of them quickly enough. Uh, from the government perspective, uh, we are discussing exactly this yesterday. Uh, first of all, governments are conservative and no risk taken. Uh, business is the opposite. The challenge is how do we use technology that, you, as you mentioned, developed for business for the government use? Uh, the first step is the lack of knowledge. The most part of the government, at least in developing countries, but also I have colleagues from developed countries that have no idea about anything what we are talking about here, mm -hmm. about, about the potential of this technology. So the first point is the lack of knowledge. The second one, okay, if they understand what are the possibilities, the second question is if it's right or wrong, but it's a risk take. So it's a responsibility for the government if they adopt some kind of technology at, uh, in an early stage, mm -hmm. uh, what are the responsibilities if it goes wrong? Mm -hmm. uh, for the public opinion and for the auditing bodies that make our uh, auditing for government. Uh, so we have to develop some kind of pilot projects, that's one of the discussions that we had, where companies could join the government, sometimes for free, just to develop and showcase the opportunities. We have some experience like that in Brazil, where companies uh, joined a specific NGO in Brazil to test new technologies or consulting problems, and they donate to the government the project. In a, in, a, in a pilot phase. Mm -hmm. After that, you measure, you prove the point, and so you make, comfort, uh, make comfortable for the government 
to have a public procurement dedicated to that. So these are the main challenges and face that not only Brazilian government, other governments also face. Uh, the lack of knowledge. How do we implement this technology with her in a risk uh, environment? And third, what are the responsibilities and how to scale up this project if it works? So I think we should develop a more close cooperation between government and business in order to solve this problem that you mentioned. All right, this panel has a kill switch. I've got to exercise it. Um, thank you all for coming. I would recommend that next year the same five panelists be invited back, but we do it with six and we add Einstein. So thank you all for coming uh, and thank you for a great panel. Thanks.